Let's uh, talk to Dr. Mike Yeadon. Uh, he's a former chief scientific officer at Pfizer's Allergy and Respiratory uh, Research Department. And he has uh, been uh, one of the co-authors of a, a new, uh, new article uh, for lockdown sceptics about, well, how likely a second wave is and whether or not all these new measures are really necessary. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Julia. Nice to be here. Nice to, nice to speak to you. Um, I was fascinated by this article and, and shared it online because um, I, I'm very much somebody, I, I was not a lockdown sceptic. I, 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 people who were sort of saying, oh, I won't wear a mask or I think lockdown's crazy. I thought that actually a lot of the measures taken by the government early on were all about, look, we've got a virus we don't know much about. We've got these computer models saying that we could be losing, you know, tens and tens of thousands of people. We need to lock down. Look, mistakes have been made, but a lot of lessons have also been learned. You are someone with experience in this field, a uh, very senior mm-hmm. figure at Pfizer, um, one of our major pharmaceutical companies. Uh, you've been looking, along with your colleagues, at all of the evidence uh, and all of the papers published uh, by very, very eminent epidemiologists, uh, statisticians, uh, virologists and the like. And you have come to the conclusion that you don't believe a second wave is actually very likely. Why do you think it is the case that we are not going to have a second wave? Okay, thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll take that. So ju- just first, um, I, I want to make a couple of comments about the Ferguson and Imperial model. I come across no, no see- serious scientist who thinks there's any validity. For example, it assumes that because the virus is novel, we were all initially susceptible and we had biologists falling about with, with, with that one. It, yes, it's a novel virus, but it's very closely related to at least four other viruses that circulate freely um, in, in the population, which are all coronaviruses and contribute to the common cold. So bluntly, it was naive of them to assume everyone was susceptible. And uh, since then, four or five major papers have come out to suggest that between 30 and 50 percent of people had T cell immunity cross reacting from uh, having been exposed to these other uh, common cold inducing coronaviruses. So, 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 that, so, so this is so this goes back to Neil Ferguson, uh, Professor Neil Ferguson of uh, Imperial College, and this computer model saying, "Oh, two hundred fifty thousand people are going to die because basically we're all susceptible. It's a brand new virus, and that's yeah. why we had to lock down." And you're saying actually anyone with any actual knowledge of this particular field would know that that was not the case. So that should already have driven some of our our policies on that front. Yes, it, 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 it should. So I'm not go- what I'm not going to do is say anything more about the model, mm-hmm. but it's important that you know um, that uh, most scientists don't accept that it was even faintly right. But I think the government is still uh, wedded to the model and it is driving, as I want to discuss with you, uh, trade-offs uh, of availability of the NHS, which is going to result in excess avoidable deaths, which I think the government has explicitly decided to do, presumably because they think Ferguson's model is correct. So that's one thing. I will talk about the second wave and I'm going to make a challenge to them, which if they can't answer it, the public will be able to conclude that I'm correct. Well, that's well. They do that. They're obviously, time is obviously relatively short. We don't have time for a sure. seminar, unfortunately, okay. Mike. As I know, you would yeah. love. In fact, I would love you to give. I might just give over my whole show to a whole, a whole right. well, seminar let, let on me, this. But let's get let straight me, to let it. Let me just say then. Let me just get right to it. So the NHS, your public and I have observed the NHS is relatively less available than normally. We were fine with that when it was coping with the peak of the yeah. of the pandemic. But I know because I have seen it, internal undeclared priorities for the NHS are to maintain COVID stance, keep the NHS lightly loaded through the winter. And the reason they're doing it is to cope with the expected second wave. Now, someone in government, either Hancock or Ferguson or Sage, has explicitly run the numbers and decided that it's okay to uh, have uh, excess avoidable deaths in order to be prepared. Now, Now, I want someone, I want you to ask them, Julia, to come on the air and actually announce the calculus that they have made, because it's not an accident, it's a deliberate policy. And that's where we are seeing huge, huge backlogs of people getting treatment, getting referral or going to the GP, getting a referral from the GP, getting treatment, starting treatment or continuing treatment. And we know we know tens and tens of thousands of people are going to die as a result of that. We've already seen excess deaths. And that's the question. And that's been obviously there's a trade off calculation that's being made by the government on the basis that, well, we will lose far more people to to coronavirus in a second wave. Why do you believe a second wave is not coming then? Okay, so two principal reasons. One, 
I mentioned just earlier that many people, 30 to 50 percent, started with a level of immunity that meant they were not susceptible to the virus at all. That is well accepted by almost every clinical immunologist and uh, virologist by now. And the reason is they have circulating T cells. These are cells that remember what you've been exposed to and allow you quickly to respond to a new but related threat. This is so, why lots of people who may well have had the virus, or certainly in my own family, loads of us had yeah. the virus and we have the same symptoms at the same time, but not everyone has tested positive for antibodies. Is these may have been people who had T-cell immunity. Absolutely. Or if people have developed T-cell immunity, it was not necessary for them to use all the efforts in their body to generate mm. antibodies. So the antibody test, if you've got it, you probably you have been exposed. But if you're negative, it does not mean you have not been exposed. Yeah. So anyway, I've talked about um, my concerns with the NHS. And in principle, I think T-cell prior immunity was a very important factor. What that meant, importantly, is only... 20% or 25% of the people needed to be in infected for the pandemic to come to a standstill uh, through the herd immunity threshold. And it's controversial, but I'm afraid it's a fact. When you look at the shape of the daily deaths versus time curve, it is obvious to any, any biological expert that the pandemic is fundamentally over. Now, you asked about second wave. I'm going to challenge the government. I challenge Professor Ferguson, Mr. Hancock, or anyone from SAGE to cite the research literature that understands, that underscores their belief in a second wave. I, I'm an experienced literature searcher, and it doesn't exist. And did you know, Julia, that the, la the last two coronaviruses, the novel ones called SARS in 2003 and MERS more recently, novel coronaviruses, each of them won wave each. And that's what most people expect with SARS-CoV-2. There's no underlying literature that says the second wave is coming. This is an assertion. And I think it's an assertion because Ferguson, having nailed his colours to the mast and observing we're only a fifth or a tenth of the way to his total, is insisting there'll be a second wave. And I think it's most unlikely and there's no science that says it should happen. Well, what, about so the people, what about the people who say, well, I mean, we had this, of course, you know, the, the flu uh, pandemic in, in, uh, in, you know, around the end of the First World War and that there was a massive second wave there. It is your yep. argument that it, it's, this, a, this is a different virus from flu but, or, or that there wasn't a second wave then? Uh, both. It was a, so it's a different virus. It's 100 years old. So we do not have good molecular biology to tell us what happened. Uh, but certainly the, there is strong evidence that there was more than one organism. Yeah. And anyway, it's old data and it's flu. And I've yeah. cited recent data with novel coronaviruses, one wave each. OK, um, so let's let's move on to what, what we should be doing right yeah. now, then, because we've got an yes. infection yeah. rate that is going up. It's largely young people we know, particularly late teens, early 20s, who've got a, a tiny, tiny, tiny chance of getting seriously ill and even tinier chance of actually dying of the virus. The government says, look, that's true, but we are now starting to see early uh, hospitalisation rates going in, going up, and we're seeing uh, the death rate going up slightly. It's still small numbers, but they're worried that it's going to rise exponentially. They talk about this to say the second wave. Uh, why do you think we shouldn't be worried about that? OK, I can I can take that easily. Now, as you know, they're going around the country using uh, the swab test where they use a technique called PCR. PCR is a molecular biology technique and it involves a terrific amount of amplification over and over and over again. Now, that technique uh, is well known to produce uh, a risk, at least, of false positives. That is, it, it comes up positive even though the virus is not present. Now, um, uh, People like Professor Carl Hennigan in Oxford has been has been banging the drum on this yeah. for ages that they should not use this protocol without revision. Now, let me tell you, Julia, last week, the government put out uh, an edict to revise the, the PCR protocol so that weak positives will be retested. But there was no media on this. This is a major U-turn because, let me just say this, were it not for the test data that you get on the TV all the time, you would rightly conclude that the pandemic was over and nothing much is happening. Of course, some people go to hospital. We'd be moving into the autumn uh, flu se uh, season. But remember, I've said there's no science that suggests the second wave should happen okay. at we, all. And even with prior go, go back over, for those of us who are not medical experts, just in terms of the swab yeah. test, PCR, these are the, yeah. the tests that people are getting when you go to, yes. you know, you, you're, you're in the community, you think, oh, I've got a bit of a persistent cough, got a temperature, I might have been in contact with someone, I'll go and get one of these tests that the government's made available. Yes. And we know that there are some false positives, uh, um, but we also, the, the concern is that a lot of these are, are what are called weak positives. The way they are carrying out these tests 
they are able to take, detect the tiniest, tiniest trace of the virus, which may be months and months old. So these yes. people may well have had the virus, may have come in contact with it months but ago. they don't have it now. They don't have it yeah. now. They're not infectious. They're not at yeah. risk of infecting anyone else or themselves getting ill. But we are basing a, a government policy, an economic policy, a, 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 a civil liberties policy in terms of limiting people to six people at a meeting and that, all based on what may well be completely fake data about the spread of the yes. virus. Hold I on, think hey, okay. Quite, but but okay, why, listen, I'm... we've got very eminent people, chief medical officer, chief scientific advisor. People are going to be shouting at the radio right now saying, hold on a minute. You may well have eminent you know, qualifications, Mike. But why do you think you know more than them? Do you think they know this as well, but they're carrying on anyway? Or do you think they have honest reason to believe that we are in a second wave and we're, we're about to start it? Yes, I... I... When, when this episode started, it was entirely fine when 30% of the samples were genuinely positive and people were ill. It wasn't a problem that maybe half or 1% were false positives. It didn't matter. But I'm afraid now the ONS survey shows that the general prevalence of the virus, how many people have it in the community, is about 10 times lower than the false positive rate. Just say it again, when you run the test, you'll find 10 times more false positives than actually exist in reality. And so they finally come to their senses and last week said, we have to change this protocol because we don't, essentially they've admitted, we don't really know how many true positives we've got. So I am demanding that SAGE and the government uh, pause introducing any new restrictions until they've made okay. the change that they've recognised is necessary and then tell us what whether we really have an uptick in okay. cases or not. Dr Mike Eden, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, I'm, I'm definitely going to get you on again next week because I want to go over more of this. And I think it's, it's very complicated for those of us who are not scientists or medics to understand a lot of this. But um, I, I think you know we're going to have to put some of those questions. We normally do get to the health secretary on at least once a week. We'll put those questions to him. Uh, but Dr Mike Eden, who was a former chief scientific officer at Pfizer Allergy and Respiratory Research. Thank you very much for that.